Hi, my name is Kel O'Neill. I am a 2017 Eisenhower Fellow. Um, and the story I'm going to tell you ends with a secret. So I'm going to have to ask for your trust here. What's said here does not leave this room until August. Got it? Great. So when I was selected for the Eisenhower Fellowship, I was at the top of a crest in my career. I was the senior Media Lab Fellow at The Economist, developing all of their virtual reality content. I had just sold uh, the first virtual reality documentary that my wife and I had made to Hulu. Um, which was kind of unprecedented at that time because nobody was acquiring 360 content. Um, and I was working on an epic, enormous uh, PBS-sponsored documentary that I genuinely believed was going to put me into a place in my career that I had never dreamed of, but had always been secretly aspiring to. And as kind of the cherry on the Sunday, I was invited to become an Eisenhower Fellow. So great. Meanwhile, as I'm stepping onto the plane in January to go to Taiwan, I'm leaving the uh, dumpster fire of everything that happened to everything on that list behind me because literally everything that I just mentioned fell through in some way. The Economist Media Lab shuttered into a, uh, I believe they called it an extended hiatus. Hulu's VR app is unusable and unsearchable. It literally does not have a search index in it, so if you wanted to find our film, you would not be able to do it. And that film that I've been working on for so long just fell apart in a legal souffle. Um, <laughs> bear in mind that we had filmed everything, we had raised all of the money, and in fact, and I encourage you not to do this, you can actually go and watch me giving a speech at South by Southwest in 2016 to a room full of more than a thousand people talking about how great that project is going to be. It is amazing how humbled you can get and how quickly you can be that humbled. So I arrived in Taiwan, not entirely sure what to do, but Definitely furthering my professional career wasn't the first thing on my mind, but I took those meetings. I met with uh, some of the leaders of the AR and VR industry there. I spent a lot of time with HTC, but mostly I, I ate really, really well. Um, I learned a lot, I met a lot of people, and I became obsessed with this small community in new Taipei City called Pingxi. I, and really, there wasn't much of a reason to be obsessed with it. All you need to know about it, it's a tourist town. It's a tourist town known for one thing, the Pingxi Sky Lantern Festival, where it's, which is a, uh, this, uh, I guess you'd call it a uh, Instagram moment generator. So all of these uh, millennials go there and they light off these lanterns and the lanterns have the wishes written on them or whatever their native language is. And the, the thing is that if, you're, if your uh, lantern rises into the sky, then your wish will be granted. And if your lantern falls, then it won't be granted. And people take selfies of themselves doing it. And it's, it, it's, a, it's an easily appropriated image. I think that you actually may see it in some big pharma commercials here. You know, people lighting off these lanterns while somebody describes the side effects of whatever medication is being sold. <laughs> So, I just started going to this town. My wife and I, we started going there. It's how we work on documentaries a lot of the time. We'll find a community and we'll just kind of just be like, well, this is interesting. It draws us like a magnet. And we keep coming back and keep coming back. And over the course of these kind of weekend trips, we realized that there was something more than just people lighting off lanterns and putting them into the sky. There was a whole ecosystem and a, a whole life cycle to these lanterns that the town was sustaining. So, young people light off lanterns. They go up into the air, they fall, they hang in trees like distended Christmas ornaments, and then in the morning, old people from the town go out into the mountains, they pull them down, they sell them back to the lantern sellers who recycle the tissue paper, take the bamboo frames, rewrap them into new lanterns, and the cycle continues the next day with the young people lighting off the lanterns, putting their youthful wishes into the world and into the stratosphere. So that's interesting. So we keep going back, we keep going back. And I believe on the third visit, 
I met a woman named Cheng Wang In who stared straight into my soul. She's an 80-year-old woman. She's probably about this tall, and she can walk about three times as fast as I can. I know that because I followed her with a camera. Um, and uh, Madam, she, she, she lives in an abandoned school on the outskirts of, of this small town. And inside that school, she's built a temple. Everything in the temple has been given to her. I was told that I should bring some kind of offering to her. I did some quick Googling, realized that I was supposed to bring oranges and eight of them because that's a you know, prosperous number. So I brought her eight oranges. She put, she was so grateful. She, uh, I didn't exactly know what it, mean, but she, what it meant, but she put it uh, on this altar that she had alongside all of these different gods, this pantheon that she had built there, uh, incense burning. Um, and she told me that I shouldn't pay too much attention to the lanterns because your wishes will never be granted. What you wish for is not what you get. What you need is what you get. It's not about want, it's about need. So I thought that was pretty interesting, especially at that particular juncture in my life. <laughs> and we made the piece and we completed the piece and I, went back home and things sort of started to stabilize. I was granted a new fellowship by the Sundance Institute, um, picked up some more work and did some other things. And as I, as I kind of refined that, at a certain point I was editing the work, checking the transcript, and something struck me um, that I found in there. And so I, I wrote my translator in Taiwan and I said, is it just me, or is she saying that the arrangement that she has with the lantern sellers that she gives the lanterns to um, is actually a trade, and it's not that she's getting money back. She's getting back toilet paper? And uh, I was told by the translator, yes, so that's what Madam Cheng did. She is literally wiping her asses with the wishes of the youth. <laughs> As I said, I, I went to Taiwan at the height of a professional crest, and I watched the cycle go down, and I, I believe that it's starting to, to rise again. And it, it occurs to me that that cycle is, is really the hardest thing to adjust to, the hardest thing to, to, to realize in your life. You, you expect that things are just going to go up, 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 but in actuality, they go round and round and round. And one of the greatest gifts that I got from Eisenhower Fellowship is that I get to go around with you guys because you are the most intimidating group of people <laughs> that I have ever met in my life and one of the most inspiring groups of people that I've ever met in my life. So that's why I feel okay to share a certain secret with you, which is that that piece, which is called What Goes Up Must Come Down, is going to be preparing at Lincoln Center um, as part of the New York Film Festival in October. And I also, I think that this is a great opportunity to apologize to my case officer. There she is. Hey, I'm sorry that I didn't do whatever thing about that new media lab that I wanted to build, because uh, I just, it ended up being a, a much simpler project, but I hope it's one of great beauty. So thank you guys. Thanks.